So I guess we just start. Yeah, my name is Rick. Welcome to the revolution. You know, you just saw the last presentation and the discussion was um, about the artificial worlds that are created in science fiction. Science fiction could be our friend. Science fiction can also be our enemy. Um, we had a uh, conference many years ago and the creator of Babylon 5 came to that conference and leaned over the podium drunk, but leaned over the podium and uh, looked at the audience and said, how's that? Do I need a mic at all? Um, he looked over at the podium at the audience and he said, I'm the one you've got to beat. Because they make the future look so good that we're the ones, we have to get out there and actually make it happen. And the steps that we take moment by moment, day by day, inch by inch. How exciting is that? Um, I'm just going to run this just to get some attention in the room here. How's this? Um, on the other hand, once in a while, we can do something. Hands of everybody who's ever owned a piece of a space station. All right. All right. Here's the situation. You're at Space Up. You're here in California. You're in LA, California, an argument against intelligent life in the universe, but here you are. And you're hearing a bunch of presentations on space from a bunch of different people. I have a PowerPoint here that I could that I was thinking I was going to do when I started. You know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm not. I'm really not. Um, in fact, I was one of the guys that stood up at a lunar conference at NASA and said, I am so sick of PowerPoint pioneering. Um, and um, denigrated it to the point where the guy after me trashed his PowerPoints. It was great. We owned a space station, Mir, for nine months, literally. The little pirate flag, it was, you know, at the end of it, I had a space station, all I got was this little pirate flag. But we owned it. We did it. I had a friend who had a lot of money. Always helps. Find yourself a billionaire if you're a space person. 
But we went out and we made it happen. Now, I, at one point, was like you are now. I was sitting in an audience at a conference or working at one because I couldn't afford to pay to come into it. I still can, I'm a space guy. But I was there watching somebody up on stage like me talk about what was possible, what could happen, or maybe what they had done or what they had written about. I was sitting there where you are. And then I started to get involved and I started to do something about it. Now, what can you do about it? It's infinite what you can do. The one thing I urge you not to do is to walk out of this room after this weekend is over and curl up in a science fiction book or in your video game or watching Entertainment Tonight or whatever the hell it is you do and don't do anything because we need you right now. We are at the tipping point of the frontier right now. Right now, in your lifetime, you are in the moment that will determine how quickly the human race expands off of this planet. Right now, like now. Like two weeks ago, the shuttle hit full stop. Wheel stop, I think is what they call it, right Jim? Something like that? Jim Busby here, space expert extraordinaire. If you have any questions, ask him about the history of space. The shuttle is over. Now, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but from my opinion, thank God. I am so glad that the shuttle program is over. Now, I say that, and I also say I honor the people that flew the shuttle. I honor the people that worked on the shuttle. I honor all those people, and many of them are my friends. But they were given a raw deal and did the best thing they could and the best work they could to make that a successful program. What you may not know is when the shuttle was originally sold to us, the American public, it was going to fly 50 times a year. It was going to bring the cost of getting into space down to like $100 a pound. Now this was in the mid-70s, the post-Apollo era. We were all still cruising on the Apollo high. We were all like excited. We were watching Captain Kirk get the babes and along comes Star Wars. And we thought it was gonna happen because it was gonna be $100 a pound, man. $100 a pound, I can go to space, I can start building space colonies. So you had Heinlein and Clark and Asimov and all these other people forming into groups like what they call the L5 Society. L5 stands for Lagrange Point 5. It's a rather stable place in space where if you were gonna put a colony like a Babylon 5 colony, that's where you'd put it. Because you wouldn't have to use a lot of propellant to keep it there. We believed, we believed that we were going to be going into space. That we were going to be living in space. That we were going to go out there and we were going to create the next branch of humanity. And it was a grand time because we were in an illusion. You know, I don't know if you know any writers, but I got to tell you this. One thing that goes on with writers is as long as they never actually write the book, it's the best book ever written. I mean, it is the world classic. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It is the best book ever written until you actually write it down and then people can go, oh, that sucks. So we were living in that moment of illusion or delusion, if you want to call it that, where we thought that this was gonna be the next frontier. I mean, I gotta tell you, I'm a little pissed right now that we're here. I mean, this sucks. Space up sucks. This entire event sucks. It really does, at a force of 1G, but it sucks. Why does it suck? Because 50 years ago, President John F. Kennedy said we were going into the moon and we were gonna open this new frontier and this damn conference should be taking place off planet. L5 and 95, LOL. I have that bumper sticker. It was supposed to happen. We effed up, we believed them. 
And so they sold us this bill of goods called the space shuttle. And lo and behold, it didn't quite turn out as it was pitched. Eh, not quite. What was the max? Uh, five times in one year, I think, was the max flight rate of the space shuttle. It actually increased the cost of going into space. Oops. But what it did do was it kept a lot of aerospace personnel employed. It kept a lot of space centers relevant. It kept a lot of money flowing into certain people's pockets. It paid for campaigns, etc., etc., etc. It fed pork to those who wanted pork. It was a jobs program. It was a program based on the aspirations of a people who dream big dreams and have grand hopes and are easily suckered in. And that was us. So what happened was we ended up with this program of shuttles flying around in circles. As a friend of mine uh, who was actually an administrator named Tom Payne said to, uh, to a, a couple of friends of myself and he on a call, flying around in circle, circles until one falls out of the sky and then we'll just keep doing it until another one falls out of the sky. He said that after Challenger. It was very sad. Brave, incredible people making do with something that doesn't do what they said it was going to do. So we believed this dream until the shuttle started to fly, and then we began to realize, oh, hell. Oh, I got to tell you, I was like psyched at first. I had my Boeing provided set of slides. Slides, by the way, are things that happen before PowerPoints. They're little things, and you shine a light through them, and they go up on a screen. Um, I had my little set that showed space stations here and then colonies down here. And I was lucky enough to work for a fellow named Gerard K. O'Neill, the godfather of soul of our movement. He was the one who brought a bunch of us together and said, you know what? You can dream. You can do this. You don't have to be in NASA. There was a time, actually, in the mid-'80s where several of us sat around in a room drinking some Guinness and pledging our lives and fortunes to this cause. And, and we kept with it, luckily. A lot of us were still in the game. And I remember sitting there, and a friend of mine was in the screen here, Peter Diamandis, who created the X Prize, and David Gump, and all these other people who you will hear about or hear about now, who are working on these things, sat in there and said, we're going to make this happen someday, because we still believed. But we got a little bitter in there in the middle. Yeah, I mean, you can tell I'm just a little tiny bit still pissed off. But we've been out there fighting for the cause. What has happened is there have been several false starts to this movement. For, several beginnings that didn't quite catch on, and then we failed. In the 90s, there were several little rocket companies. Dick Slayton and these other guys tried to do it. Um, we had a company, in fact, Diamandis, myself, and a bunch of us had a company, uh, Microsat Launch Systems. Um, that was great. We were actually out trying to raise money at one point. We were having a cocktail party for uh, people, uh, people to come in, and uh, this was in 89. Um, uh, <laughs> We're having this cocktail party, and we have all these waiters and all this, and this is a hotel in New York City. And um, all the waiters were um, um, of Arabic descent, shall we say, uh, uh, it looked like. And we found, and, and then one of the waiters started asking questions about the rocket to somebody, and he was asking the downrange capability of the rocket. And we, we ended up calling Deke Slate, and we found out that all the waiters here at, at our uh, reception uh, worked for Saddam Hussein. Um, <laughs> they had approached him too. Uh, but we had, a, we had a false start, it didn't happen. You know, It's like that scene in Monty Python, I built, I built a swamp and then it sank, I built another one. And you know, it, it didn't happen. Burned down and fell over, thank you. And uh, I paraphrased Monty Python, which makes my friends crazy. Um, and so what happened was we have all kept going. Because once you get this dream, once you are in this audience, one or two of you in this audience right now, this weekend, will probably end up going and doing something important. You know, I don't know which one it is. You're having an internal conversation in your head right now. It's me, it's me, it's me. I hope so. Or it's like, that guy's flush, whatever, you know. But I hope it's you. And we went out and we started these companies and we failed. And we started them and we failed. And we've kept going. Now, the 
other side has kept going as well. Mordor. Um, yeah, I have a friend who has a, a thing called Yuri's Night, and, um, which is awesome, and I urge you to go. It's one of the best space parties in the world. And I was talking to her at one point, and um, she was like, no, space is great, man. We got all these aerospace companies behind us. Let's go, let's go dance. Let's go have a good time, because space is just awesome. It's just super. And, and I said, well, you know, but there's some real battles. We go, oh, Rick, you're always so pissed off. You're always fighting, and, and you, you know, you, you wear black. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, and, and I said, look. You know how in the Lord of the Rings it just came out? I said, you know how Lord of the Rings, you got the hobbits, right? And they're in there, and they're having a little party, and they're doing the little dancing and stuff. And then you got the guy sitting in the corner who's dressed in black. And the hobbits are like, who is that guy? That guy is weird. We don't want to hang out with those guys. And he's a ranger. His job is making sure that Mordor doesn't sweep in and Soren doesn't come in and take over and get rid of you hobbits who are having a good time celebrating space. There are some of us in the cause, and in my organization, the Space Frontier Foundation, uh, and others that are out there, some of them you've heard from, some you will hear from, who are fighting a battle right now. It is the battle for the frontier. It is the battle to make sure that you have a chance to go into space. Because it's not just about whether our friends, the engineers, and we had a batch of them uh, from the Mojave crowd and all of that, can go out there and build great rockets. Because they can. And they will. In fact, it's an amazing thing to see. And I've been out there and I've watched them fly and I've, I've watched them test and I've watched them cry and I've watched them laugh and I've watched them celebrate as that thing that they poured their heart and their soul and their entire family and everything into and it takes off and it flies. And it's, there's no better feeling. I was there watching Spaceship One. I was one of the founding trustees of the XPRIZE in the early days there. And I was honored to be so. It's an amazing thing when it happens. But they can't fly and you can't dance unless somebody is out there making sure that it can happen. And I'm urging you, people in this audience, to take up whatever it is you take up and hit the barricades with me and those of us who are out there fighting this fight the battle for the frontier. There are people who actively want to see this stopped because it threatens them. Heaven forbid, I'll, I'll give you one example. There's a thing called what we call the Senate launch system. It is a congressionally mandated super heavy lift vehicle that is basically designed to provide a lot of jobs. You notice in that sentence, I didn't say open space carry payloads, carry us to Mars. I didn't use those words. Why? Because they're not true. It's designed to provide a lot of jobs and some campaign funding so that people can maintain their power bases, keep, their, keep going on what it is they do. Because, you know, we've ended the shuttle program and those jobs are threatened and those congressional districts need the money. And those people who represent those congressional districts in our perennial campaign culture need the money from the people who are going to give it back to them. I just set up a lobby in Texas called the Texas Space Alliance. And one of the interesting things, uh, we're working with a company called Blue Origin to pass a liability waiver so that tourists, unless in case of gross negligent, negligence, can't sue the company's flame. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about a lobby, the tax exemption of a 501c4 IRS recognized lobby is that you can write off your contribution if you're a company as a cost of doing business. So if you're company A and I hire you to build a rocket, you can take, and I'm the government, and I give you a million dollars to build a rocket, you can take a percentage of that million dollars and hire a lobbyist to come hang out in my office so that I'll give you two million dollars next year so that you can pay that lobbyist again to come back and lobby me again, and I can write it off as a cost of doing business. This is the culture we're up against. Senate launch system. Sounds good. Big rocket. I know the guys are like, hey, big rocket, man. I love that. You know, big rocket to nowhere, as Keith Cowing called it recently 
Um, NASA Watch, by the way, is a great site you should check out if you're new in the field. Big rockets to nowhere. $38 billion might do some test flights by 2021. Now we've got up the street here, we got SpaceX. I've heard, yay. And uh, I think I heard Elon say I, he wouldn't know what to do with like a billion dollars right now. Although I, I'm sure he would take it. Um, it's a free enterprise guy. We are in a transitional period. As I said at the beginning, we're at a tipping point in our culture where there are a group of people who feel, well, not bad an eye. They will look you dead in the face and say, give me $38 billion and I will maybe fly something in 2021 that you'll have to give me another 30 or $40 billion for at that point so that I can actually carry people around in it because you know that's not included necessarily other than the original test flight in my budget. And they will look you in the eye as if that's your patriotic duty to cut them that check. Because it's space. Because space is something we do in America and Americans do space through NASA. And we do space through our aerospace companies. I'm gonna take a second. There's three kinds of people that you'll run into in the space field. This is a little excerpt, a little sidebar from a book I've never written, probably never will, called Rick's Handy Dandy Guide to Space. Three kinds of people you're gonna run into. First, there's the Saganites. Saganites are people who love to look at space. Space is big, billions and billions of stars. Isn't it grand? God's universe, God's hand written large across the sky. Space is great. Check it out, but don't touch it. Don't touch it. We'll send robots, we'll look at it through telescopes. Don't touch it. I actually like that crowd. Help fight to keep the Hubble up a few years ago. Then there's the Von Braunians. When we were going to space, we will do it for you. And you will watch television and be very, very proud of how we are spending your tax dollars building very, very, very large rockets. And we will shoot them into space. Sorry. I gave a version of this talk in Huntsville a few weeks ago. I had One of the old rocket team came up to me afterwards, a fellow named Putcomer. He's like, Rick, why are you always yelling about the... Okay, you know. Like, the funny thing was, five minutes later, I was like, I want to show you my plan to go to Mars. <laughs> Signed it for me. It was cool. Okay. So the third group... Thank you. The third group are O'Neillians. O'Neillians believe, and, and Jerry O'Neill was the father of this. Read the book, The High Frontier. It's a little bit dated, but read it. He believed that we should take our tools and our imaginations and go out into space and harvest the resources we find there and expand civilization in the domain of life. I am an O'Neillian. <laughs> Thank you for directing my speech. <laughs> How many of you think you are O'Neillians? I'll go with you. Good deal. I'll tell you this, Elon Musk is an O'Neillian. Dave Mastin just raised his hand, he's an O'Neillian. Jeff Grayson of x -Corps is an O'Neillian. Bob Bigelow, Bigelow Aerospace, is an O'Neillian. Diamandis is obviously an O'Neillian. We are O'Neillians. We are the people who are creating the frontier. The battle for the frontier is happening right now. You need to participate in it. You need to walk out of this room and call your senator, call your congressperson, call your local reporter, write an editorial, write a blog, tweet if that's all you can freaking manage, and get out there and say, I want the frontier opened. I support commercial space. There's a program called CC Dev. CC Dev, that's the one that's gonna be paying, to carry, paying private companies to carry people into orbit. NASA just gutted it to fund the Senate launch system and their own other pet projects, all right? They're gutting it. 312 million is all that's left in the budget. It's barely enough to do it. They're gutting it. We need your help right now. Now, in a minute, Dave's gonna get up here and talk about a strategy and an overarching set of plans. This is what we need. We need to understand 
that the goal of the United States in space isn't pretty pictures, it's not big rockets, it's not a few short-term jobs. You know what? The carriage industry is over. It's those nasty, smelly automobiles that are going to be the jobs in the future. Let's stop circling the wagons. Horse tech is over. It's a new age. It's a new day. It's time. I want NASA astronauts out exploring. I don't want them driving trucks and building buildings. That's what we do, the settlers and shopkeepers. In the correct structure, at, if this were the way it needs to be, NASA would be the Lewis and Clark function. They would be out on the edge of what I call the far frontier, going over the hill, over the edge of the horizon, and reporting what they find there with robot precursors. By the way, I cannot have a discussion about people versus robots. Mmm, doesn't make it through my vocoder. I can't have that conversation. Robots go first, people follow. Robots don't breed yet. <laughs> it's a partnership. It's what we do together. I'm a frontier person. I'm a settler. I need to settle. I'm going to go out there. So together, we will do it. Thank you. Hey, just a quick announcement. Um, so 5.30 coming up is going to be our last pod for the day. Uh, after that, we're going to have dinner. Uh, it's going to be Rubio's right over here where we serve lunch. Uh, and then we're going to start our uh, T minus 5 talks and the Igniter demo. So uh, stick around after this. OK, that was an excellent sermon, right? <laughs> um, so what I want to talk about real quick is Basically, uh, a, 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 well, about a month ago or so at the uh, ISDC conference uh, in Huntsville, Huntsville Alabama, uh, my colleague uh, Jeff Grayson, uh, who happens to be uh, a friend and a competitor in Mojave, gave a beautiful talk about the fact that NASA does not have a strategy um, and that we need to develop a strategy. And he gave an example of one strategy. He wasn't even sure that that was the right strategy, but you want to see a strategy. I'm going to go one step further. In, in the military science, we talk about uh, strategy, we talk about tactics. There, there is a third part to this. It's called grand strategy. Now, strategy is the art of the general. That is what it means in the original Greek. It is all about what does the general do out in the, the, the theater of war. It is choosing the battles to go to. Tactics are winning those battles or doing whatever it is you need to do in those battles. Uh, there are a number of historical examples where uh, losing the battles was actually better, uh, spe especially in the American Revolution. But the strategy then is choosing those battles and making sure that as you choose those battles, you end up in a better position than your opponent. Grand strategy is actually something that's a little bit more recent in military science. Um, and it came out mostly a lot in World War II in terms of actual practice. And that was the, uh, to compare it to, you know, strategy is the art of, of the <laughs> general. Grand strategy is the art of the king or Congress and president in the case of the U.S. And that is, how do we use our educational resources? How do we use our civilians? How do we use our industry to enable the general to conduct his war? We have no grand strategy right now. Or we have a whole lot of different grand strategies. I can tell you what the grand strategy of Senator Shelby is. 10,000 jobs in Huntsville, Alabama. The grand strategy of the Utah delegation in, in, the House, in, in the House of Representatives right now is a several hundred million dollar profit for ATK and therefore a certain amount of money coming back to his campaign. The grand strategy suggested by Obama was the budget he put out in 2010. 
which was actually a legitimate grand strategy. We will develop the technology. It does not look like budgets are going to be in all that great of shape in the future, so we're going to try being a little more flexible about how we do things. Instead of immediately rushing out and building these big, huge, wonderful rockets that'll maybe make it to the moon one time, we're going to do a little more research. We're going to do a little more technology development. The Obama administration had actually not only looked at the Augustine Commission reports and read it, they actually understood it, which is actually a first for a president. Uh, there's been a long number of, of commissions and committees and reports made for presidents, and they've all been ignored. We finally have a president who actually paid attention. Unfortunately, he's more of he has a scientific mindset, or an engineering mindset, not a politician mindset, because he failed one major thing that you, the worst major sin in Washington, D.C. is not to socialize an idea. The scientist doesn't worry about socializing an idea, they just present the facts and say, and therefore, here's my theory. And other scientists, and, or, if it, or in engineering, you look at it and say, yeah, you know, I think you're right. Or, well, no, I don't agree with that, but here's, my, here's, the, here's the facts I think contradict that. And after a couple of going back and forth publishing studies, you get to a consensus. That's not how it works in DC. Um, bizarro world is the most often heard and most accurate description of Washington, DC. It is truly bizarro world. Um, I happen to know of a, a few companies who have gone to Florida and have talked to a number of people in Florida about, hey, you've got this wonderful workforce that's not going to be working on shuttle anymore. How can we uh, help out, i.e., we want to hire some of your best talent? Um, <coughs> the state of Florida has been extremely helpful. Um, the counties around the uh, Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center have been extremely helpful. The federal delegations have not. <laughs> Apparently, we're not the right company. They want to make sure they get uh, the jobs come from USA as opposed to Maston or some of the other companies that might be doing business down there. Uh, we're not good enough, I guess. We pay the same wages. We pay similar benefits. I don't understand why. Um, <laughs> why, why we're not good enough. But apparently, well, we're not good enough. So, anyway, that's that, that's basic situation in in Washington D.C. right now. It's for some strange reason the senators don't like us, um, but everybody else does, and we don't have that grand strategy going on. Or I should say, we have a lot of grand strategies that have absolutely nothing to do with the benefit of the United States as a whole or getting to space. Um, and, and this needs to change. Uh, Rick mentioned commercial crew. Uh, the commercial CC Dev is what it's called. Uh, it's actually not NASA has anything to do with this at this point. It's the House passed the recent legislation that cut it to, I believe, it was 300 million from the president's request of 850 million, which I think is terrible. This is the one program in NASA that is actually having great success. Milestones are being hit on schedule or ahead of schedule. I just saw a recent uh, news release from the Sierra Nevada Corporation that they hit yet again another milestone, uh, something like two months in advance of when they were supposed to. This is a program that's working. It's doing the right thing. Uh, we also just saw the announcements from um, Boeing that the Atlas V was selected for the first three test flights of the Boeing capsule which is excellent. Um, very good rocket. Um, wish they would have picked SpaceX, but that's my own personal bias because I've got friends at SpaceX. <laughs> um, let's see, what else? And so that's one of the examples. Uh, the other major problem was the office of, of the chief technologist. The idea here was to have a, a chief technologist to sort of help bring ever, all the technology development in NASA and actually develop technology, do research and development. 
this is something where, you know, it's supposed to be sufficiently advanced that myself as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, is going to look at it and say, too risky. I can't afford to do that. This is where governments can step in and help the economy. And believe me, I'm not somebody who says governments should be helping out at all. My idea of government helping out a, pri a businessman is stay out of my way. <laughs> um, <coughs> that means staying, that's part of staying out of my way is don't take all my money away from me. <laughs> um, however, <laughs> there, there are certain realities that we have to deal with. There is some, uh, a, a, something known in economics as uh, public goods. And science and advanced research is a public good. It is a legitimate public good. They will not be provided in the, the optimal amounts unless you have a government step in and help it out a little bit. This is what NASA should be doing. They should be doing the basic science research. They should be doing the research and development that's too advanced for a, a for a businessman to be able to go out and raise the money to do. That is the type of thing they should be doing. And that's not what we're seeing. The space launch system, the Senate launch system, I should say, is specifically all about using 1960s technology. And to fund this, they are eliminating budgets for technology development. And I said 1960s, this shuttle redone, but you know what? The shuttle was actually 1960s technology. Why are we 50 years along and still using the same technology? <clears throat> so another thing that really needs to be pushed. Oh, what was my question? Oh, I thought I already told you the answer to that, because that's what saves the jobs for Senator Shelby, Senator Nelson, Huntsville, Alabama, Kennedy Space Flight Center. They, and I, I, I don't even understand the reasoning behind, I mean, they want to protect jobs, but the Office of the Chief Technologist put a lot of technology development out of Marshall. Their plan for spending their budgets on technology development was going, a lot of that money was going to Marshall. They would have been creating jobs in Marshall above and beyond what they already have. I have no idea why Senator Shelby is so opposed to this. But NASA needs to be working on the advanced technology projects. They should not be doing the stuff that SpaceX, Maston, x -Corps, Bigelow, want to do on our own dime. We're offering those services to NASA, saying, hey, you can use our services. We're actually cheaper. And to give you an idea of just how much cheaper, NASA still cannot figure out how it is that after they've looked at SpaceX's books, SpaceX is doing things about one-tenth of the price they estimate NASA would take to do it. And by the way, NASA always underestimates what they think it can do anything for. <coughs> so, where are we? One of the things you can do coming out of this is contact your congressman. Guess what, he's in your hometown district any, any day now, he's supposed to be getting back, I'm not sure exactly when they're going on recess, but the month of August, they're out wanting to shake hands with constituents. And tell them you need NASA to be doing science and technology. Commercial crew. Those are the three concepts. And, and let your con let your congressperson know that that's that's what's important. That's what's going to get us into space. That's what's going to keep us going. I am actually very concerned that the space launch system continues to get funded, and they try to build it. In four to five years, it's going to get canceled and NASA's human exploration systems is going to get cut completely. And we cannot afford to not be exploring. 
in the, fi in the 15th century, I believe it was, China was one of the great exploring nations of the world. The Chinese government decided to no longer be that great exploring nation. A few hundred years later, they were being dominated by another great exploring nation called Great Britain. I don't like being second place like that. We need to keep exploring. We need to keep growing. We need to keep expanding. And uh, I think that's my rant for today. <laughs> questions. Give me questions. Go ahead. So let me see if I'm, I'm trying to understand the question here. There's a self-fulfilling prophecy thing going on here where the workforce... Um, it turns out to not quite be the case. Um, there, there is some difficulties there, but I think uh, there are plenty of people more than happy to work on SLS. Um, plenty of people happy, I mean, let's face it, it's a long enough project that they're likely to see some good flights if they start on it now with, as a younger person. And they're, uh, they have a nice long career ahead of them. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it, and, and there are a lot of people who still think, uh, even in the industry, that you have to work for NASA or a prime contractor to be an aerospace engineer. So, and that's what they, that's what they enjoy, that's what they do well. I think 53 tons is the ideal amount for a heavy lift vehicle. Oh wait, SpaceX didn't give me any money. <laughs> um, no, actually, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion you can do more with less. Um, I, I think, uh, actually, there's some argument about exactly where in heavy lift you actually need. Uh, the, the Bigelow BA330 is about 25 metric tons, so that really needs that order of heavy lift vehicle. Uh, Delta IV heavy can also lift that uh, payload. I don't see where we need anything bigger than that, really. Um, there's, uh, I've done a, a couple of mission studies. I'll probably be talking about a lunar um, set of lunar missions uh, tomorrow. Um, and quite frankly, yeah, that's that 25, 25 to 30 metric tons is all you really need. Um, and that's with existing stuff. Uh, we start factoring in some things that aren't as developed. We can probably even go with smaller payloads. So can we realign missions and organizations to focus more on, on what they should be focusing on? Um, to a certain extent, I think it's actually quite difficult. The, the industry, the, the, especially the new space companies, um, in the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act of, I believe, 2004, we specifically asked Congress to put into their language that the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation have the dual mission role of safety 
and promoting the industry. And we did this not because we're, we're a little bit, dis I'm a little bit disappointed in how the FAA is implementing this. What we wanted out of that was for the FAA to regard their safety mission as a promoting the industry mission. So in other words, we wanted to avoid the possibility that they would say, oh, well, we could achieve our safety role. If they had only safety as their only role, they could just say no to every one of our requests for launch license or experimental permit or what have you. So we wanted them to say yes. We wanted them to say yes in a way that everybody knows it's going to be safe. We're not going to hurt people. Um, and to a certain extent, and a lot more than people think about it, but you really, the biggest way to promote an industry is to make sure everybody knows it is actually a safe industry and, and that it's not going to go out and kill people. Um, the, as a couple of now defunct airlines can tell you, the quickest way to bankrupt you is to crash an airplane and kill some of your customers. Um, we're well aware of that. We're not going to go killing our customers. Trust me. It's in my best interest to not do that. So that's, that's sort of, now FAA said, okay, well, we're going to have a line of business that concentrates on, your sa on all the safety concerns, and then we're going to have another line of business that does promoting the industry. And they're really not supposed to do that. But otherwise, there's really not that much mission overlap in a lot of ways. Um, there was some discussion earlier in pod two about um, different roles that different organizations, even with the Department of Defense, have. And they actually have different missions, even though it looks like there might be some overlap, there's not that much overlap. Any, uh, any other questions? The cutting edge. Um, one of the, one of the, well, actually, I mean, go go to the uh, NASA uh, Office of Chief Technologist uh, website. They've got a ton of information, all the stuff they're looking for. Um, some of the things I that some of the high, what I think are the highlights from that list: um, advanced propulsion techniques for in space use. Um, wa basically, ways of getting to Mars that doesn't take a year. Um, cut that cut that amount of time down. Therefore, we cut down the amount of time that our astronauts are exposed to radiation in outer space. Um, let's see, what are some uh, propellant depots? Uh, that was actually something. Uh, if you've been following the news, uh, yesterday, two days ago, something like that, uh, NASA announced uh, four contracts for doing initial studies on cryogenic propellant storage depots. Um, which allows you to use much smaller vehicles, launch vehicles, um, and then you do assembly of your main mission spacecraft in orbit and then send it off to Mars, um, which has a lot of benefits, including a much larger payload mass that you can actually deliver to your target than what you can do even with a Super Saturn V or an SLS or anything like that. Um, those are probably my two biggest highlights. Uh, there's a bunch of other little technical things that <coughs> need work, but yeah. CC Dev, commercial crew, CC Dev. Uh, so yeah, uh, Office of Chief Technologist needs money. We need. Technology development and, and basic science. It's, NASA needs to be working on those goals. Um, it should not just be a jobs program for uh, some southeastern states. No yeah, and that money can definitely come out of SLS. <laughs> and I hate to say this, but you could probably take even more money out of SLS than what you put into these other programs and therefore save even more money on the budget, especially if you have a Republican congressman. Because, <laughs> you know, they're supposed to be a little more conscientious about that. Yeah, well. <laughs> yep. Any more? Going once?
going twice, go eat. Oh, wait, we got one. A general sales pitch of what Mastin will be delivering for you. Low cost, space access.